The purpose of this interview is to document the experience of a Navy sailor in World War II at the beach of Omaha in Normandy, France from the year 1942 to 1946. Our themes for this interview will include the storming of Omaha Beach, the time that our veterans spent on the Higgins boats, and the German prisoners and soldiers that our veteran was in charge of after the war. This interview is being recorded for the Veterans Oral History Project with Harold Beal, a former member of the Navy. I am the interviewer. My name is Hannah Billings. My partners in this project are Nelson Perez and Jesse Bundy. Also in the room listening to us today is journalism instructor Jeffrey Hope. Instructor Larry Ayot is shooting video for our interview and is being assisted by NESCOM student Jacob Richards. We are also joined by students Zach Hocamp, Zach Hewins, Sebastian Atkins Taylor, David Furtado, and Keon Butler. The date is April 18th, 2016. We are at the New England School of Communications at Husson University. Mr. Beal, thank you for doing this interview. Thanks. Would you please state your name, date of birth, and where you are from? Uh, Harold Beal. I was born on uh, October the 27th, 1925. I live in Southwest Harbor. Okay. okay. So to start things off, my first question for you is why did you decide to enlist into the Navy? Well, <clears throat> I didn't want to go into the Army. I was brought up on the coast down in Southwest Harbor. I've been on boats all my life, so I figured I'd rather be on boats. And uh, that, that's, I, I volunteered. I didn't, I wasn't drafted. I volunteered. You volunteered. How did, um, how did your parents react to you volunteering? <laughs> they wasn't, wasn't too happy about it, but uh, they realized that I had to go. That you had to go. Now, when you shipped off to boot camp, um, first off, how old were you at that time? Seventeen. Seventeen. And how, what was it like for you being at boot camp? Well, I hadn't been around much further than Portland bef before. Uh, so uh, that's the first time out of the state of Maine, really. And it, it was different, but it was, uh, you know, seemed interesting, so I'll put it that way. And where was boot camp held for you? Pardon? Where was boot camp held? I was in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Newport. I, was there. I spent 12 weeks there. Did you make lots of friends while you were at boot camp? Friends? Did you make lots of friends while you were at boot camp the first oh, couple of weeks? Oh, yeah, you make friends easy. Make friends easy. Um, now, can you tell me about your time on the different ships and boats um, that you were on while you were in the Navy? <coughs> when I got out of boot camp in 12 weeks, they wanted to know what I wanted to do. I told them I wanted to be amphibious and I wanted to be a gun in space. Now, actually, all the time that I spent in the Navy, I was never assigned to any ship. I, uh, any time, I was mainly on LCMs, which is the landing craft mechanized, or LCVPs, which is the landing craft vehicle personnel, the Higgins landing craft. And, uh, any time we was going to go to an invasion and stuff, we was carried there by LSTs. They used to hoist us up, so actually I, I never was assigned to any ship. I uh, spent time uh, in New Newport, Rhode Island, and um, Corpus, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, Little Creek, Virginia, and uh, Fort Pierce, Florida for training. Mm -hmm. And when I left Fort Pierce, Florida, I came back and uh, New, New York and I got onto a British troop transport and I went across on that. And what was the training for you like while you were in Florida? That was good. I, I was, I was uh, trained on guns. Mm -hmm. I started doing some uh, seamanship stuff, but uh, they found that I had been doing that all my life you know, on the boats and stuff, so they didn't put me in. They kept me right in gunnery class all the time. And uh, down there I worked on uh, 30 and 50 caliber machine guns. We had 30s on the small boats and 50s on the big boats. And what were your responsibilities as a gunner's mate? Well, 
I just, uh, we, we were on our own, so to speak. We had to take orders from the coxswain when we was there. He was in charge of the, of the small boat. But after a short time of training down there, and uh, when I got back into southern England, uh, we was in uh, Fooey, Cornwall County, down in southern England. And we trained there all winter for 1943 on these boats. I, st I had a lot of time to study, and I passed uh, uh, into a, a third-class petty officer. So that put, they put me in charge of four or five different gunners' mates, and we, we trained together. I had to charge of them. Now, your time in between um, being in southern England and to uh, storming Omaha Beach. Can you tell me a little bit about that? <coughs> well, we we uh, loaded the boats and uh, run different, uh, you know, rocking down the coast of southern England just as if we was going into invasions. We trained on that. And like I say, we, we did that all winter. And uh, we had to learn each other's, uh, what they did in case something happened to somebody. So, of course, I, I knew all about running the boat. I didn't have to worry about that. My biggest <laughs> problem was signaling. I, I wasn't very good at signaling. And I helped the motor machinist on the engine, so I helped change the filters and stuff on the engine. Get, and so we all, everybody knew what everybody else did. And we, we did that right up until uh, the latter part of May. Then they shipped us from there up to Falmouth. And uh, we stayed there a couple of days. And then we, they finally put us, told us what LST we was going to be on. We hunted it up and found it and uh, we, they hoisted us aboard. We didn't know then why we was going or exactly when we was going, really, because it, it was pretty well secret. Mm -hmm. But we found out uh, the night of the 5th of June that we was, actually we'd left Elmuth, was in the English Channel, and they told us where we was going. And what was your thought process the night before? What was? What was your thought process? What were you thinking? What was going through your mind? <clears throat> well, I was kind of excited, you know, you're an 18 year old kid. I, I turned 18 in the middle of the ocean going over. And uh, you're an 18 year old kid, there's nothing worries you. You know, you, you feel pretty good, uh, kind of excited about what was going on. You, in other words, you don't realize what it's all about. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the storming of Omaha Beach? what your responsibility was and what happened that day? <clears throat> well, like I say, I was, <clears throat> I was a gunner's mate, mm -hmm. but uh, I had no guns. <laughs> well, we had air superiority, and uh, the, we didn't need any guns because we couldn't shoot of anything. There was all the Americans around us, mm -hmm. and actually none of us on a landing craft carried a rifle anyway. We was all given 45 sidearms, so that's that's all I had. They didn't give us a machine gun because they, like I say, we didn't need it. And if if we lost the boat, which they knew they was going to lose a lot, they didn't want to lose the gun, so they didn't give us any. And what was it like for you storming the beach? If you need to take a moment, we can. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <coughs> they, uh, they get, we get in there it's in the middle of the night. <coughs> they lowered us into the water. And we uh, went to the nearest troop transporter. And the... Uh, uh, they give us 
<clears throat> Let's think a minute. We loaded up 36 men and they climbed Count Kygo nice to get in. And when we got them in, we, we went off to the, off the bow, we went into a circle. And we stayed there until 6.30 in the morning. And at 6.30, of course, all through the later, in the middle of the night and around, they were shelling the shore. We had hundreds of, hundreds of ships offshore. So we figured it was going to be pretty good because they was going to clean them right up. But it, it didn't work that way. They, um, we started for a V formation towards the shore. <coughs> we hadn't gone very far. We got hit by a 88, I think. And uh, of course, the four of us Navy fellows was in behind a, like a petition by the engine because we had no guns or anything to do, so we were way down the bottom of the boat. And when we get hit, it uh, raised the devil with the Army fellows, of course, killed a lot and took the bow off, so we, the boat went down anyway. Uh, when we got back to the surface, four Navy fellows, that's all that was there. Because the Army um, fellows had a lot of gun, ammunition, grenades, they had a lot of weight on. <coughs> and the ones that didn't get killed was in the water, because they went down. And they had so much weight, they didn't get a chance to get it off. So they just didn't come up. But we swam back to the nearest troop transport. We were still a long ways from shore. We were trained that if we had to and lost our boat, we were supposed to go fight with the Army, but <clears throat> it didn't look good in there. We were a long way from shore anyway. But we climbed the cargo net and uh, we got up on deck and we was resting up and an officer asked us what we were doing, we told him. And uh, he says, well, come with me, I got a boat, the crew has been hurt, you're going to, you take their boat. So we did. <coughs> and that time we went ashore and we did make it, but on the way in, it's uh, you grow up quick. I really, I really, really didn't think we was going to make it. But my job on the boat, besides being the gunner's mate, there's a a thing on the side of it that uh, lowers the ramp and raises it. My job is to lower the ramp when we hit the beach. When we did hit the beach, I lowered the ramp. And uh, then they just seemed like every gun was on our boat. But it, it was rough that day, turned us around sideways on the beach. And the coxswain says, if we're going to really get all this, we're going to get the hell out of this boat. Well, some many men laying on the ramp, we couldn't get up over the ramp, so we jumped over the side, head boat, up, up to putting it up to our waist in water. But the water was colored. And uh, actually, I've had a long time. I've forgotten from there until late that afternoon up on the beach. Now, you told me last time we spoke that um, 
getting out of the boats, the Higgins boats, you hurt your, your knee. Can you tell me exactly what happened with that? I didn't hurt that then at that time, no. Oh. No, the, uh, it, what wounds the four of us Navy fellows had were superficial. There was nothing serious. I, I got a, quite a lot on, on this arm mainly. But nothing that I had to have sewed up or bandaged up or anything, salt water took care of that. But I got my leg hurt. I got a jam between two London, two LCMs in July, or okay. just, just shortly after that. And, and uh, I slipped the leg down between the two boats, mm. and one had a tank on it, the other one had a little ammunition. And my leg was a little bit bigger than the fenders were, so I got jammed quite bad. Now the Higgins boats, those are the ones that you stormed the beach with, correct? Can you tell me a little bit about those? It's a nice boat, it's a good suit. It, uh, it really, if it hadn't been for the Higgins boats, it been bad. It was, uh, it was only 36 feet long, but it carried uh, 36 men. Or you could take a jeep with a 37 millimeter gun, but we, we, never, we never happened to carry any of those. But we, I used it all, all summer. We, we stayed right on the beach after I landed there. And um, when we, <clears throat> that afternoon when I, when I did remember something, <clears throat> we, we stayed on the beach that night. I, I did, I, I didn't know where my crew was even. But next morning I went down onto the beach, the fighting was all inland then over the beach and I found the beach master and uh, hunted around I found found my crew and uh, they had come through it all right they, they didn't get hurt but they put us on they took 12 of those Higgins boats with the uh, 48 men and we run shuttle work we took wounded fellows out. We took prisoners out. Brought in small stuff, blood plasma, stuff like that. And I, I did that all the time, right up until I got hurt in July. So I can say that we made a lot of trips back and forth through June. I was. We was pretty good. We they bombed us about a, about every night, about ten o'clock. They'd come over. <laughs> you you wonder when the next one comes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but it uh, we when I got hurt when I hurt my leg, <clears throat> they took me up to the field hospital right there on the beach. I spent four or five weeks there. And they put me back on the ferry. We had a ferry boat that was anchored inside of the breakwater. They took seven Liberty ships and sunk them just outside the beach so that they was on bottom of the, the superstructure was out of water, high water, to make a beach, a breakwater, a smooth beach. It's quite, quite rough on the English Channel most of the time anyway. But we, they took this ferry boat and anchored it inside of that breakwater, and we lived on that all summer. And I, I got back uh, out of the hospital. <clears throat> they, I couldn't do anything. I was on light duty. But they, uh, they gave me a machine gun and a German prisoner, officer. He was educated in Harvard College. Nice fella, hell of a nice fella. But he uh, he didn't want to fight, but he he had to, because if he didn't, they'd have done away with him. But when they overrun the beach, the D-Day, he fell down into a foxhole and stayed there. When they overrun him, he stood up and surrendered. That's how he got out of it. So well, they kept him right on the beach, and uh, he was an interpreter. But, I mean, 
the, the German people themselves, they're good, they're all right. It's just the uh, Nazis and the, those are the bad ones. I know I talked with uh, <coughs> some prisoners. We, well, what they did, they took a big rhino, a big badge, and they filled full of gasoline, ammunition, stuff like that, and they beat it high water. And then they'd bring these trucks down, and the driver of the truck might say, I want 500 cans of gas. I would tell the officer, well, of course, he knew it, he heard it, but he would tell these, we had 12 prisoners, and we had a different bunch of prisoners every day for six weeks, but I had him every day. But they, they would do what he told them to do. When we had a little time, I might find a, one or two fellows that maybe I could speak to that spoke some English. They, they was all right, they was prisoners. But it seemed like every bunch that we had, not every bunch, but most of them, they had one, two, three, 12, 13 year old kids. That's bad. What were the prisoners like? Were the, they, you said that they were kids. Were, did they know what was going on at the time? Or did they have no idea? You mean the Germans? Yeah. <coughs> Talking to the other prisoners, they would speak to you, and they was all right. Kids wouldn't talk to us. They was, they was told that uh, Germany was going to rule the world, and they was going to be so they come right out of kindergarten, put them right into a military camp, and they was trained. And they was very, very bitter. Because they still, even though they was prisoners, they figured they was going to eventually would be winning the war. Now, back to the, you, you said the Higgins boat was a great boat. What about it made it so great for you? <coughs> it was it was easy to get onto the beach and it, I mean when you you go in drop the ramp and they get rid right of you go right back and get another one and they had a 671 GM engine in them they they moved right along pretty good of course when you get your 36 men in the equipment they're set down in the water so you push a lot of water with that flat bow so. It, but when we was in train, I think, I don't recall for sure, but it was something like uh, 1800 RPMs was governor on the engine. The day before the invasion, we took the governors off because uh, then they turned right up real much. They figured they, the engine wouldn't last very long to turn at that speed, but they didn't expect it to. But I think there's something like from 18 to 2800 RPM, so it made quite a difference. And you could really move it along pretty good, but they, they handled good. Really, the LCM, of course, uh, I think Higgins built some, some of those too. They had two 671s in them. They're, they're very good, easy to get around. You could step right there with the reverse one engine heading on the other and spin right around. The coxswain that I had in the first boat, he come from down the hills of Tennessee. He'd never seen a boat in his life. So I had to teach him how to run the boat, which was quite a, he was, he was good, he'd done a good job. When we got ready for the invasion, he knew what he was doing. He was good. Um, you said that the German soldier that you worked with, he understood English. Did you ever have an opportunity to meet any other Germans pr before you got off that ship, or was that the only one that you made a lot of contact with? Well, I, I, once in a while you'd talk to some of them each day. I, like I said, we, we worked there every day after I got so I could there, mm -hmm. and that was my job with this German officer, and uh, we would unload the boats. They would put them on these trucks and they would go to the, right to the front. Most of them, they called them the Red Ball Express. 
They was colored drivers, very, very good, nice fellows. It was a dangerous job because uh, <laughs> when they left there, they really moved to try to get to the front just as quick as they could. Once in a while, somebody might take a wrong turn, he'd end up in the wrong place. That was bad. So it was a dangerous job. But the other things too was sleep. They, they just drove and drove, and sometimes they'd go to sleep. And do you know what happened to the prisoners after they got off the boat? They, they shipped them back here and put them into, uh, like I say, we had 12. Then that night, they would put them back on, onto a troop ship, yeah. prison ship, and they'd bring them back here. Now, my parents had a lobster wharf down in South Otaba, and I worked there quite a lot. And we had a lot of people from overseas that come there for lobsters and stuff. I have seen Germans there that had come in, and I got a chance to talk to a fellow one day, and he, he said that he was uh, one of the Hitlerites. He was probably four or five, five years old, younger than I was. At that time, he was just as normal as could be. He, he said he, he really, they really believed what Hitler told them. And I didn't think that they'd ever be able to rehabilitate them. They did. So this gentleman, have you seen him again since that, that day when you spoke with him, or no? If I, have I seen have, have you seen him again since then? The, no, the no, they were just over here visiting. They stopped in to get a lobster and left, but he seemed, you know, pretty normal to talk to him. But they, they came back because Maine had a lot of prisoners here in the state of Maine, especially up in Rutherford County. But they got to, to the, the people treated them so good and they were fed so good and everything, none of them ever tried to escape. I mean, yeah, up in Rutherford County, you don't want to try to escape up there because that's a hard place to try to get out of. Mm -hmm. So they made friends with the people there and after the war was over, a lot of them has come back that's why I see this fellow. I mean, he evidently, in fact, he told me he was somewhere out towards the Canadian borders where they can't, where he was camped. Mm -hmm. But he came back and he wanted to go see the friends that he had made friends with. And now after your time in Normandy and after the ferry, um, did you come back here to the United States? Or did yeah. You, yeah. Can I you got tell me a little, uh, little bit about that. We, uh, when they opened the port of Cherbourg, of course, Germans destroyed that. When they finally got it open so they could use it, they didn't need the beach anymore, so they sent a crew back to uh, England. We, there was only, I think, four or four of us boats was the only ones that they needed there at that time. So we was, I was actually the last one to leave, really, on the beach. When they closed the beach, our four boats were the last ones that left them. So I was one of the first on the beach, one of the last off. But we went back to England. We got on uh, uh, our, uh, a hospital ship. They had another fellow that was a gunner's mate. He and I stayed together from there until the end of the war. We were both second-class gunner's mates at the time. And they kept us together. But this ship, this ship that we got on was a, used to be, originally rather, it was a German luxury liner. They turned it into a supply ship for the battleship Scharnhorst. And when we sunk the Scharnhorst, they captured this boat. They brought it back to this country and turned it into a hospital ship. And that's what I went back on. We get into New York two days after Christmas of 1944. And they gave us 30 days. They called it sick leave. You go home. Well, it's pretty good, you know. Hadn't been home for two years. But. When we came back, 
I don't know whether you want to volunteer the information or the questions, but I, I can keep going for a while. Go right ahead. Tell me all about it. <coughs> but we got out uh, in, uh, third, after the 30 days we came back, they sent he and I down to New Orleans, Louisiana. Now down there, there was no place to live, no barracks or anything, so we lived in private homes, ate our meals in restaurants, they called it S and Q, subsistence and quarters, and the government paid the bills that we had gathered. We worked from there down into Texas. I worked in the Houston shipyard, installing five inch 38 guns on Liberty ships. There was building them there. And we had to go some into Corpus Christi, used to go aboard tankers that came in to fill up. We'd go aboard and check the guns, make repairs or whatever they needed, and check the gunners' quarters in there, make sure they was kept neat and everything. <clears throat> when the war ended, they sent, he and I went back into New Orleans, and our job there was disarming Liberty ships or whatever. We disarmed all of those ships and took the guns and ammunition off of them and took them across the Mississippi right there into a place called Algiers, is right across from uh, New Orleans. And we did that every day. <clears throat> At night, he and I volunteered in the USO. We worked in the USO every night. I got a little gold U.S. open for 50 hours volunteer work. But I, one night, one night we left there and we thought we'd go down to this honky tonk and get us a hamburger and stuff. And I had a uh, 41 Oldsmobile there. and there were seven of us left there and went down because them days, there was nobody on the road because gasoline, you know, your uh, civilian only got five gallons of gas a month, so you didn't see many people on the road. But I'm coming back through, now this is, this is comical. I was coming back through the southern end of, of New Orleans, coming up a side road about one o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, this car came out of nowhere it hit me right broadside. It drove us across the street up over a curb and in, in hit the side of this house. <clears throat> we got out of the car. Of course, in my car, we got shook up, but the only, there was a girl sitting in the fellow's lap in front and got her arm cut. She went through the window. She got quite bad cut. The, the fellow in the car was a doctor. He was going on a house call. That's why he was speeding so. But while we was waiting for the ambulance to come to get him, this fellow in the house says, what part of the Navy are you in? Because we naturally was in the uniform. I says, I was, I was in Uncle Sam's plywood Navy, Higgins Landing Craft. Big smile come on his face. He says, uh, you know who I am? I says, no. He says, I'm Andrew Jackson Higgins. I stood up to say I'm the President of the United States too because I thought he was joking, but he really was Andrew Jackson Higgins. And we talked most of the night. Fant and I stayed there with him. The rest of them went into New Orleans. I had Christmas dinner with him that year with he and his family. Nice fellow. He was quite a gruff fellow, but he, he was really, really good to his people. He gave all of his, everybody that worked for him in the factories, where, uh, he gave them all a raise, but it, with the understanding that they would take the money and put it into a war bond. So save it, and also save it for bonds. And now when you say he was a gruff fella, what do you mean by that? You hmm? said he was gruff, what do you mean by that? You know what we got for governor now? <laughs> yes, sir. Gruff, he was like that. Okay. But, he was a nice fellow. Okay. Now, what sort of things did you two talk about? Oh, he wanted to know what we did and how the boat handled and all different things and, and uh, how long I had been on them. I, I told him that we 
we, that we, that's all I trained on was LCMs and LCVPs. Actually, when I was in Fort Pierce, Florida, I was on the uh, LCM, the, the 50 foot steel ones with the two engines. But when we went across to get into southern England, they put us into LCVP, so I had most of my training on them right there in, in England. But they was, they was a good boat to handle. They, they well, I guess they were made with plywood, but they had the quarter-inch steel down both sides of them. So a lot of the bullets coming at you, you could hear them. They hit the side of the boat, but they'd glance off because that steel. So now after your time in New Orleans um, and working with um, going back and forth to uh, Texas and Mississippi, uh, what did you do after that? Where did you go? After what? A after you were done with in New Orleans, um, transporting the ships oh. and everything, where did you go after that? I, I went back home. I got discharged March the 8th of 46. I'd been in since 42. And I had, I had probably with PTSD. I had uh, about 60, 70 years, 60 years I, that I couldn't talk to nobody. I have been able to for about five. I came back, I had to have the, my leg operated on again in 1915. <clears throat> I was in Togus and uh, I was operated on the same day the Korean War broke out. So naturally that kept me out of the Korean War. But when I got out of there and got discharged, after I got uh, discharged from the hospital, I came back home. and. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to get away from people. I didn't, I couldn't talk to nobody. I'd done a good job of driving trucks because I drove the truck before I went in the Navy. I was 14 years old. I was hauling fish and lobsters to Portland for my father. Of course, there wasn't much on traffic on the road in those days. But I, I stayed right on trucks 50 odd years hauling lobsters out of Canada, Newfoundland, around into Boston. So it was, it was bad. It got me away from people, which was good, but it was, I was made an awful poor father and an awful poor husband, awful hard in the family. How did your parents react when you came home? <laughs> Glad to see me, I guess. Glad to see you. <laughs> but, uh, Nobody, nobody tried to talk to me much. I had a lot of nightmares and stuff. I had, but I had to live with sarcastic, everything. But I, when I had the last operation in Togus, oh, probably 12, 14 years ago, they took the knee out, and I, I got an artificial knee now. But. Uh, I still have the muscle. I can still use it. I have a lot of trouble because the muscle has got crushed. And if they take the muscle out, I would be stiff here, and I didn't want that. So sitting here, I'm, I'm all right, sleep, all right. Unless I turn over in the night, sometimes it wakes me up. But, but it's uh, standing and walking that bothers me. I, I, can't, I can't do much with that. So. Your wife, you said you were married and you have, you have children, correct? When, you, How long after you got home did you meet your wife or did you know her prior to I joining know, the service? I knew her before the war, yeah. We, we was, I got out in March of 46. We were married in, in um, June of 46. We were married 23 years, two daughters. And uh, like I said, I didn't talk much. And I, kids were scared of me. I was a poor, I was a poor father, poor husband. I realized it. But after my daughters got grown and married, my wife left. I can't blame her for that either. And uh, I lost my youngest daughter 
five years ago, six years ago. She never knew what I did. But uh, after I had a, a session in Togas, I got a pension on my leg because I, they want to know how it happened stuff, and I, I broke down a lot. I still do. Uh, they got me in the to Bangor here in the PTSD group. And <clears throat> I had a leader there that was uh, very, very good. He was very good. I got to give him credit for everything I got. Uh, he retired after 15 years, and he says, I want you to go to, up to the museum and talk to the kids. <laughs> I said, you know better than that? <laughs> no, he says, I think you're, I think you're ready. Go up and listen. So I went up to Coles and I listened to every group in a couple of days. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll try it. So I'd, had, well, I'd have one fellow, one kid. And uh, I explained to him that I, uh, I don't hear good. I hear too much. I don't understand. Uh, I get this thing here that I can hear in most anybody in the room, but if two people are talking, I don't. But anyway, sometimes I have trouble thinking of what I want to say because I don't want to get back into some of the things that I've forgotten. But uh, I, I, tell, I told the kid when I started up to the museum, I said, I don't hear good and I break, break up a lot of PTSD. So just bear with me, I'll be okay. And I really enjoy it. I, when I started that, the main reason I did uh, try it, they always told me the kids didn't want to hear anything gruesome. I said, well, that's fine, because I don't want to talk about it anyway. But it's what they do want to hear, really. They want to know what happened. I have a lot of problems getting it across sometimes. But believe it or not, they're, they're really interested in what happened. They wasn't taught this in school for years. I had one girl three years ago. And she says, um, was you in any battles? I said, yes, I was in battle. Well, where was that? I said, did you ever hear of Omaha Beach? She thought a few minutes, and then she says, uh, Nebraska? I said, Omaha, but not the beach. And you know, I had to explain to her everything about the beach and how really that was the beginning of the end for Hitler. She'd never heard of it. But now they do, they teach me. We have, we have a little. I've been there, uh, it's been pretty near five years, I think now, I've been with the kids uh, and that therapy for me I, um, I don't know. I just, uh, I, 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 they're really, really interested. You get a lot of the six-year-olds, they, you know, they're looking around, they're not paying attention. And if I get one that doesn't pay attention or is fooling around or something, that bothers me, and then I don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, I have to pay really, pay attention to what I want to say, and if somebody's talking, they can't understand. But most of the time, I've, I've had a lot of good kids. What is the most common question that the kids ask you? What, was you in the battle? Yeah. Was you hurt? Was you taken prisoner? Just things like that. And one no, they want no for, if you think you're a hero, of course, no. It's like I tell them, 
really the, the only hero you guess is the father that didn't make. What are your thoughts about military service, um, both today and during the time that you served? Well, it was different. It was a lot different. I mean, back when I was in, you had a lot of stuff that wasn't like it is today. Today, they can send something out here and pick a needle out of a haystack 50 miles away or something. So it makes it a lot different. I really, really uh, got to take your hat off to these kids now because I uh, have so much trouble well, from one, just one battle. They get it every day. They got to worry about the landmines and all this. I, I don't know why, how any of them comes back without being PTSD. But I would do, I like to see them all that need the help to get it. I didn't go because I didn't think it would do any good anyway. And I didn't want to go and talk about it anyway. But when I went in, there was 18 World War II veterans in my group, and we was all the same. And we, we talked amongst ourselves. We broke up all the time, but we didn't pay no attention because we was all the same. When I break up in front of people, it bothers me, embarrassing. But uh, uh, I, uh, I, I like it up there with the kids. I really, really do. Do you ever get a chance to talk with any veterans who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan up at the Cole Museum? Not, uh, no, I haven't. No. Uh, no. We've, we've got in the, the groups that I'm with, uh, there's, uh, I think most of the times only three, of the, uh, most of the times I three World War II veterans in the group. Most of them are uh, Korean, Vietnam now. There aren't too many of us left. Now, before we end this interview, do you have any final thoughts or things that you'd like to say? Well, I'm just uh, glad to be here. I'll put it that way. <laughs> I, uh, I can remember the day that I didn't think I was going to be. But I, I have, I've really improved a lot since I've been in this PTSD. That's one of the things that Galen Cole has, Brian, he's had me on TV a lot, he's had me in the papers a lot, and got another fellow, Norm, the, that was in PTSD, and he's up there. He wants to prove to people that need the help to go get it, because it does help, really. And he just wants them to know that I'm living proof that it does help. Well, both myself and the rest of my class, thank you for your service, and thank you so much for doing this interview today. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's a wrap.